A former President Trump's big lie, it echoes from the halls of Congress to the campaign trail. You could say Biden won the presidency kind of like OJ is innocent. It's the same kind of, it is not right that hundreds of thousands of votes are allowed to be considered as lawful votes and we know they're illegal. By removing the fraud, Donald Trump won. We know there was fraud, this election was stolen, Donald Trump is our president. Makes your brain hurt, doesn't it? Uh, whether seeking office or simply approval, Trump loyalists have made a mantra of the election being stolen. But that big lie has a companion. Let's call it the big hoax. It's a separate fantasy that Trump is the victim of a Russian hoax because the infamous Steele dossier has been somewhat discredited. And it's not just pro-Trumpers propping up that illusion. Under the title, It Wasn't a Hoax, in The Atlantic, our guest writes, Quote, instead, at almost every turn, Trump was helped by people who had little liking for him as a human being or politician, but assessed that he could be useful for purposes of their own. Yes, uh, that should have been an exclamation point at the end of that sentence. David Frum is the author of that article. He is a staff writer at The Atlantic, was a speechwriter for former President George W. Bush. David's with us now. Um, I mean, let's, let's start with this. Who are these Trump non-loyalists yeah. uh, who are doing his bidding? Well, President Trump is gone, and a lot of people think that means he's forgotten. And that means uh, there are a number of people in the media world, um, some of them working at prestigious places like the New York Times, some of them working in the, the new media of Substack and podcasts, who say I, the, the Trump story, without justifying him, can be used to score points of people I don't like. People like you, television hosts they don't yeah. like, media persons they don't like, um, off, off politicians they don't like, like, like Hillary Clinton or Adam Schiff. And they don't like them for other kinds of reasons, not Trumpy reasons, reasons of their own. And so they, uh, they focus very specifically on the defects of the Steele dossier and leave many people in, uh, with the impression that if the Steele dossier turned out to be kind of soggy, as, as it was, it was as, as it immediately, as we said at the Atlantic, as it was, I never, I never wrote about it. Um, if that turns out to be soggy, then everything, all the other evidence about something untoward in the Trump-Russian relationship, that goes away. Well, help us walk through this, David. I mean, what, and I, I read your piece and I saw yeah. your Twitter thread about this. Help us walk through some of the various items that still hold up to this day as being very big problems for Donald Trump and Russia. Well, let's start with the trigger of the investigation. Yeah. Um, and this information all comes from the Senate Intelligence Committee, which at the time had a Republican chair, um, Richard Burr of North Carolina, and at the time whose leading spokesman was Marco Rubio. Um, so the, the Senate Intelligence Committee confirms what many reporters knew, um, which is that the, the investigation, the FBI investigation of Donald Trump began when one of his aides, a man named George Papadopoulos, sought out the Australian High Commissioner to London, a man named Alexander Downer, took him out for drinks, had a few drinks, and then told uh, Commissioner Downer that he knew that the Russians had hacked uh, Hillary Clinton and Democratic emails and would be using these to Trump's advantage. Uh, this was in the early spring of 2015. Um, Don uh, 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 sorry, 2016, I beg your pardon. Uh, Downer uh, wrote a report to his own Australian government about this important conversation, and the Australian government a member of the Five Eyes group that shares intelligence, forwarded this information to the U.S. government, and that is what began the FBI investigation. But there's more than that. I mean, the one that I come back to um, is, you know, Donald Trump Jr.'s meeting at Trump Tower uh, with a Russian attorney who said she was there on behalf of the Russian government. Paul Manafort, uh, there as well. Jared Kushner, there as well. They admitted to it. Yeah. Well, let's take a, a macro view now. Yeah. I told you about the trigger. Yeah. Let's, let's think about this just, yeah. here's the question, and I don't claim to have an answer to this. Yeah. Through 2016, if you were a gambling person, if you went to make book, most of the bookies would tell you Hillary Clinton is probably going to win. Um, the Democrats are probably going to win. Hillary Clinton is probably going to win. Um, Russia is a country with an economy about the size of Italy. Uh, it is an enormous risk for the Russian state to intervene in the extreme way in an American election against the person who's probably going to win. Why did they do that? Why, they had never done anything like this before. And they, in the communist days, they would do little espionage things, but never so much against one candidate for another in the face of negative odds. Why? 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 That's the question. And then you look at the, the long history of financial relationships between Trump and bad actors in Russia, and you think maybe the answer is there. We don't know because when Robert Mueller said, I'm going to, was charged 
go investigate this, he was told at the beginning, oh, one thing, one place you mustn't look must, is at the financial record. It's like one of those episodes of Columbo where you're told, look, you can go anywhere in the house, but not that closet, the one with the bad smell coming from it. Don't look in the bad closet. And by the way, everyone in the house, when you ask them about the, the bad closet, lies about it. Right. Well, and, I mean, and you also had Michael Flynn, the yeah. very first national security advisor for Donald Trump, fired for lying to investigators about his contacts with the Russian ambassador. I mean, the, the thing that I come back to, David, and, and please yeah. go in any direction you want with this, is that it would have been law enforcement malpractice yeah. for any of these items individually not to be investigated. Well, the thing that is so fascinating about the Flynn deception is Flynn was involved in many things he should not have been involved in. But he was not part of the Trump rush. He wasn't at the meeting at Trump Tower. He had, no, he had nothing you would think to be afraid of. Jeff Sessions, the former senator who became Trump's uh, first um, attorney general, who lied to Congress, he wasn't compromised in any way. So why did they lie? And it's the, it's, and I think I don't get it. To this day, it, I still it's, it's like an episode of Columbia. They know yeah. there's something bad in this closet. We don't know what it is. Trump knows what it is, maybe. We don't know. But what we know is when Colombo comes and says, what's in the closet? You say, what closet? I have no idea. So, I mean, it's hazardous to lie to the FBI. It's hazardous to lie to the Senate. And yet Trump people did it. Why? What were they afraid of? They weren't implicated. They weren't protecting themselves. They were protecting Trump. Yeah, over and over and over again. And before I let you go, I, I, I do want to talk to you about um, House Minority Leader Kevin McCarthy. As he's reacted to these horrific and Islamophobic comments made by Congresswoman Lauren yeah. Boebert. Uh, she suggested that Ilhan Omar was a suicide bomber because she's Muslim. Uh, McCarthy, we're, we understand now here at CNN, says he spoke to Boebert on Friday and encouraged her to meet with Ilhan Omar. How do you think Kevin McCarthy is handling, I mean, we were talk, I was talking about this earlier in the show, handling this freak show caucus? Yeah. You know, it, it seems to be a strategy of appeasement in the hopes that someday he will still get to this promised land of being Speaker of the House. And at the same time, he has to almost humiliate and embarrass himself every step of the way by appeasing these people he knows have no business being in Congress. Well, well, well look how Nancy Pelosi behaved when she was confronted with um, behavior she thought was unacceptable from um, members of this famous squad at the beginning of, of her speakership. And, she, and she, she sat them down and said, you're not going to do this or that. And she told them, by the way, you have certain aides. I don't want them working for you anymore. Um, and she enforced the departure of aides that she thought were inappropriate. That's how you act when you have control over your caucus. McCarthy is acting like a man who is afraid. I mean, he's, he's not acting like the Speaker of the House. He's acting like the concierge of the House. Like it's going to be his job, it, should he get a majority, to placate these weirdos rather than read them the riot act. I mean, you're the speaker. It's a really important job. Yeah. And they're not senators. They can't disrupt the proceedings. You can talk to them and tell them what's what. Nancy Pelosi did. Why can't Kevin McCarthy?